Welcome to Strip Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for nearly the last installment of this crap. Nearly? You are so close. You've only got a couple episodes to go. Still too much. I mean, just looking at the pages, this is the old man in the sea we've got left. You have four chapters and an epilogue. That's it. Adrian reads Harry Potter. Mm. Coming to an end. Coming to an end near you. So we read chapters 31 and 32 this week. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Uh, Indeed, riveting we chapters. Did. Riveting. Let's go over them a little bit. Chapter 31, the battle for Hogwarts. Uh, battle preparations are made and Harry confronts the Grey Lady. Uh, we do get some ghost mythos and Harry uses the power of thought and remembrance to just magically remember, oh, I'd seen that lost diadem that no one had ever seen before. That'll be easy to find. Uh, it was in the Room of Lost Things. So we go to the Room of Lost Things, where Crab summons Fiendfire, which consumes the room, including uh, damaging the diadem enough to destroy it. It destroys Crab. Uh, Hermione and future Mr. Granger uh, are off in their own little world, but they went and destroyed the cup. So all we have left is the snake, and one of the Weasley twins dies. Yeah. A lot going on there. Good battle. It is amazing. It is absolutely phenomenal how little actual stuffs has taken place on camera through the first 600-ish pages of this book and how little stuffs takes place on camera during these two chapters. Okay. Chapter 32. Uh, the Elder One, Voldemort, is in the Shrieking Shack with Nagini, the last Horcrux that we need. Uh, chaos battle scenes here and there. We don't really get a good image, but we just find out, oh, this person's fighting this person. Things are happening. Actually, that is much more detailed than is actually in the text. Think so? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Snape arrives to Voldemort as he is summoned by Voldemort. Uh, and the kids watch as Nagini kills Snape. So Voldemort might assume the full power of the Elder One. And Snape tragically dies in Harry's arms, but not before pushing out one memory for Harry to save. Technically, wouldn't Nagini have the Elder Wand at this point? Because Nagini is uh, the killer of Snape? Yeah. It's possible. I guess we'll see where that's going. I mean, you've got four chapters. Yeah. Clearly, as we've seen here, you can fit an entire book's worth of action in one chapter. Well, as long as you don't show any of it. It's just, things are happening. Yeah. Things are happening, things are happening, things are happening. So, Adrian. How are you feeling? Where do you want to start with this? I'd like to start on page 616. And this is while all hell is breaking loose, and we are talking to a ghost that we've never talked to before because we need something that we've never had before. Convenient ghost. Yeah. Uh, convenient ghost happens in convenient place. And we get this exchange. Uh, and this is at the end of a few exchanges between the two where Harry Potter is beating around the bush, and she's sort of uh, in that very British way saying, oh, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, somewhere, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's a different British accent. No, I like to imagine that's exactly how she sounds. I don't know. Um, we get this exchange. I stole the diadem from my mother. <gasps> you, you did what? I stole the diadem, repeated Helena Ravenclaw in a whisper. I sought to make myself cleverer. More important than my mother. I ran away with it. Sounds fairly Slytherin, doesn't it? However, he did not know how he had managed to gain her confidence. Oh my goodness. And did not ask. Why would he? And simply listened. Of course. Hard. I'm sorry. Listened hard? As she went on. My mother, they say, never admitted that the diadem was gone, but pretended that, it, that she still had it. She concealed her loss, my dreadful betrayal, even from the founder, other founders of Hogwarts. Then my mother fell ill, fatally ill. Then my mother fell ill, fatally ill. In spite of my perfidy, she was desperate to see me one more time. She sent a man who had long loved me, though I spurned his advances, to find me which is just a hell of a sentence. She sent a man who had loved me, comma, though I had spurned his advances, comma, to find me. She knew that he would not rest until he had done so. Harry waited. She drew a deep breath, threw back her head. He tracked me to the forest where I was hiding, because all men are natural trackers. 
When I refused to return with him, he became violent, because all men are naturally violent. The Baron was always a hot-tempered man, because all men are naturally hot-tempered men. Furious at my refusal, jealous of my freedom, because men are always jealous of freedom. He stabbed me, because men are just natural stabbers. The Baron? You mean the Bloody Baron? Yes. Wah, wah, wah. Said the Said the Grey Lady, and she lifted aside the cloak to reveal a single dark wound in her white chest. When he saw what he had done, he was overcome with remorse, because all men are naturally remorseful. He took the weapon that had claimed my life and used it to kill himself. Because all men are naturally suicidal. Actually, studies show that, right? All these centuries later, he wears his chains as an act of pen penitence. As he should, she said bitterly. <laughs> Need I remind you that this entire exchange is happening as the world is burning around these people? Yeah, they're literally um, in the trenches of war. Yeah. Quick, lady, we have minutes before the end of the world. Okay. But let, let me, me tell, tell you, you everything tell. about me. Every last thing about myself. Because women are naturally that way. You know, <laughs> sometimes when you're reading a text, you don't catch on to like certain little things. You said she threw her head back. If you imagine that, like if you actually go by the painting J.K. Rowling's giving you, very coyly, she just throws her head back and she's like, and he followed me into the forest. It's not well done. She is such a terrible writer. Such a terrible writer. Like, like well, and it's, I'm sure it's wonderful for kids. Okay. Right? Uh, I'm sure it's wonderful as a transition text. It's magical. Um, adults should not be enjoying this. I hate to break it to you. Here's what perturbs me with this one. And this has been my argument consistently for a while now. And maybe this is just something that has like finally sparked with me with Harry Potter and like it connects. It's pure happenstance. Pure fucking happenstance. It's not magic. It's just happenstance. Everything's been happenstance this entire series. Harry doesn't do anything special. Harry just is. And this lost diadem, which no one else has seen in 50 years since Tom Riddle found it, magically, he just remembers. He's like, oh, it must have been that. Oh, yeah. oh, I can't remember where I put my car keys last night. But Harry remembers this from three years ago. He's like, I did see a lost diadem once. I bet I can go get that. I don't know if that's all that unnatural. I have a weird memory for weird things, too. You're doing that weird thing that you do with your neck sometimes, that you just sit like this for no reason. I'm hunching. I'm, so I'm hunching. Yeah. Yeah, everything happens by happenstance. No one is actually good at anything. Uh, the only people who are quote unquote good at anything are so good at things that no one has any idea how they pulled anything off. Voldemort. So good at things, no one has any idea how he is where he is. Fair. Diddledore, so good at things that no one has any idea how he planted the things he planted so many years ago that suddenly come to fruition. Um, Snape, so good at what he does that no one has any idea how he concocted an entire book of spells at 16, 17 years old. And we're going to talk about Snape a little bit, but I, again, this is one chapter. This is one chapter of 36 chapters, 37 if you want to count the epilogue. Uh, in 30 of those chapters, nothing has really happened. We've been concerned about finding this Horcrux, we're going to get it, we're going to get it figured out. In this one chapter, Harry goes from knowing nothing about it, to knowing exactly where it is, and destroying it, while simultaneously Hermione and Ron destroy another. Yeah. One chapter! So through approximately 180 chapters of this series... This is a book's worth of action in one chapter. This entire book should have been this battle. That's fair. None of this book was this battle. No. How much of this battle actually happens on quote-unquote camera? On camera. Hardly any. We see some spell casting here and there. A uh, crab attempted to uh, attack Hermione. But that's it. Which one of the weasels was it that died? Fred. F so Fred died. We don't even see who cast the spell, do we? No. We're sort of hit. So we, we're taking shelter behind a wall. 
and Fred stumbles back into the room and dies or is in the room with view of how does that happen? And devil's advocate on this one here, you know, the chaos of war, you probably wouldn't have seen who attacked him and who right. killed him. So, but you have to paint that picture. Well, here's what, from a writing standpoint, here's one of the most interesting things um, that is counterintuitive that I've ever come across in writing, in, in um, writing instruction. So if you want to build the scene of a crowd, okay. what you do is you show individual faces. Because if you just say there were 300 people there, that means nothing to someone reading a text. Okay. They just sort of populate it with, like, um, with, remember when, when we were kids, the, whenever there was like a football game in a cartoon, there was just a little the dot. head yeah. and then a, a triangle for a body in the crowd. That is how a reader will populate that. What you have to do is you have to show a reader individual faces in the crowd, um, which by showing individuals, we get a bigger picture of what's going on, which is one of the most counterintuitive things I've ever heard about writing, but it works. We don't have... One thing that would help this battle scene is if we have little movements from people, if we understand that McGonagall is missing her right arm, so her she now has to cast spells with her left hand, uh, and they're a little bit wonky because she's right-handed, you've got a much bigger scene of war, don't you? That's fair. Just by showing little things. Now, I, I appreciate something J.K. Rowling was trying to do, but again, she's doing it way too late in the series. Oh, that makes one of us. She's doing it way too late in the series, and that's why she was trying to build a mythos for the ghosts. That's a good point. This is something we could have been playing with this entire series. <laughs> now, you don't like the mythos, it's fine, because it proved that men are bad. No, 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 no. I was just being facetious with all that. Um, it's just... So... She's more than welcome to have that as her story. And I think that would have enriched the text if this was part of the uh, overall text of Harry Potter. Absolutely, it would have. And it's hard to blame a writer who didn't know they were writing a series when they wrote the first book. You know what I mean? Like, she had no idea this was going to become what it was. Um, but the one thing that really stands out to me is how violent that is. Uh, it includes, a, it is a murder, a, a homicide suicide. Yeah. But when we're in the midst of battle, we don't really see anything. We don't. Uh, and this is also coupled right along at the end of this chapter, we basically see a man burned to death. Right. At the next chapter, we basically uh, see a man who gets his throat slit by a snake. Yeah. There's a lot of violent things going on here, but it, it's, it's just so subtle and passive, like the entire uh, scene of war, you just don't get anything from it. And you know, again, Children's text, you don't want it to be hyper-violent, but the hyper-violent is there. It's just not being alluded upon. You just showed a murder-suicide. Yeah. You just showed a murder. Now, just because, so here's, here's the weird thing that I can only imagine was going on. If I am having a character tell the story of a murder-suicide, I'm not showing the murder-suicide. But if I'm showing the murder-suicide, I'm showing the murder-suicide. That's ridiculous. You're showing the murder-suicide either way. And at this point, this book is not written for children. This book is written for the children who have grown up at this point, and they're wanting their fan service. So they can handle that murder-suicide at this age. It's fine. But, again, we're just picking and choosing random things to throw in here. We focused all this time and energy building this mythos five chapters from the end of the series. For what? So Harry can magically remember that, oh, I've seen that diadem. I can go get that again. Yeah. There's, there's, it, it's, it's bad. And, like, the worst is coming. I'm, oh, my God, the worst is coming. I'm glad you're coming to this revelation, but every book in this series has worked in this exact same way. And that's the thing. I still enjoy the Harry Potter series. It, it does hold a lot of nostalgia for me. It I does. bet you would not if we started over at book one right now. I could do it again. You could do it again. I like Harry Potter. You'd be doing a lot more of this. True. Uh, you are going to nitpick, and let's be honest, we've been banging away at this for three years. We sure the fuck have. So, uh, let's move on past this here. Let's talk a little bit about old Snape. Oh, uh, well, I've got one okay. thing to get into before that. Carry on. Uh, on 620, Tom Riddle, who confided in no one and operated alone, might have been arrogant enough to assume that he, and only he, 
had penetrated the deepest mysteries of the Hogwarts castle. I am Dark Lord. <laughs> um, further, on 653, I have performed my usual magic. I am extraordinary. <laughs> but this wand? No. I am Dark Lord. Feel better about yourself? Someone has to. I'm just saying right now, we should commemorate this three-year venture, this series. You need to go get a tattoo that just says, I am Dark Lord. I, I will have no such writing on my body. That is a sin. Mm. Um, one small thing that is semantic, but very telling. On 633, his glasses, giving his eyes some small protection from the smoke, he raked at the firestorm below, seeking a sign of life, a limb or a face, yada, yada, yada. That's not how glasses work. No. Dalton, how many times in your life, you're a smoker. Oh, yes. You're a glasses wearer. Yeah. How often does that smoke get trapped between the lens and your eye? Where, it's not fun. Where that smoke is just bending your eye over backwards. Yeah, you take your glasses off in smoky situations. <laughs> But that's okay. J.K. Rowling doesn't wear glasses. It's fine. <laughs> and apparently fine. never has. That is not how glasses work. So, let's talk a little bit about good old Snape. Because he's being put to rest at this point. Well, I figured it out, right? I mean, I called it. What's the call? That he... he Diddledore was sure that Snape would kill him because there was some type of dark magic at play. I had assumed it was because if one of if you lose your life to dark magic dark magic has something to do with your soul thereafter okay but it's because snape didn't snape wanted none of these other people to control the elder wand okay at the moment he kills diddledore he owns the elder wand okay right so snape was doing uh dumbledore a service by killing him so he would have control of the elder wand Yes. Okay. And by doing it so aggressively, like, look, Diddledore in that situation, he's done. Okay. The, the, he's done. There's no escaping that situation. Um, I suppose Snape could have killed all of the Death Eaters that had been there. Um, well, they didn't know Harry Potter was there, right? So he couldn't have used Harry Potter's aid. But um, assuming that Snape is as powerful as Snape seems to be, he could have killed all those other Death Eaters. Okay. Especially since one was Greyback, right? He was. So there's not much magic going on there, just ferocity. Do you remember how uh, old Greyback goes? How he's incapacitated? I don't remember. Uh, during the Battle of Hogwarts, one of those little mini cutscenes that you get, uh, Greyback, the fiercest of fiercest Death Eaters, a living monster, a werewolf capable of tearing people to shreds with his teeth, with his claws is knocked over the head with a crystal ball by old Professor Trelawney. Puts him out. I guess there is probably some commentary there to be had with old school magic and the werewolf. But that's garbage. Yeah. So you know how J.K. Rowling has this amazing tendency to just like right at the last second be like, you know what? I had an idea and I want to put this in my book. It's coming. Any ideas what that memory of old Snape's might have been? Um, it, so here's the, the way that these things work in Harry Potter. The chapter of or after someone's death there is some reason to reconsider how we knew them. Okay. So there's going to be something in there that makes us like Snape. Okay. Or that, not necessarily a baby face turn, um, but something that will make him more on the side of good than bad, or at least something that will make him sympathetic. Redeeming of Snape. Somewhat, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's coming next week, and boy is it a tale. And uh, I'm excited to Is that to a pun? Is it a werewolf joke? It's not. It's oh, okay. not. Uh, the chapter itself is called The Prince's Tale, but... Oh. Yeah. Um, it's... Is it... In... So, I have to ask this now. Is it an entire chapter of someone rambling while they're dying? I don't want to ruin it for you. Because we had almost an entire chapter of that 
that ghost rambling while the world was burning. Like, I, I don't want to ruin it for you. Is it just, is, if it's rambling, that's not going to ruin anything for him. You well, say yes or no, it's rambling. Well, like, technically Snape can't ramble because he died. Right. But he gave Harry his memory. Well, you, oh, So yeah, in the midst of this huge, like, end of days battle, I bet old Harry's just going to be like, you know what, I could go check this memory out. He goes to the pen sieve. The whole chapter. Why the battle in the castle is burning. Isn't the pen sieve in Diddledore's office? It is. So he goes all the way through the girls' dormitory to Diddledore's office. All the way office. upstairs. To Diddledore's office. <laughs> it's just, it's so bad. I understand how kids liked this book. Okay. I don't understand how people are still defending this series. Okay. I don't understand. And look, I, I'm not I'm not calling anyone stupid for this. I'm I'm I want to understand why adults like this. Is it strictly for nostalgia? Because many of the things that people love to return to from their childhood, they return to because there is some other redeeming quality or there is some added textuality to that thing in light of being older. On my end of things, there is a lot of nostalgia for this for a number of reasons. Uh, as a child reading this, it was magical. It was fun. It was enjoyable. You get that sense. But this is also one of the first books that I ever really tackled. And when you're 10 years old and you burn through that size of a book, that feels like an accomplishment. That's something you're proud of. Um, I'm going to be the bad guy of the internet right now. Nostalgia has no merit on its own. Grow up. <laughs> Nostalgia itself holds no worth. Okay. I don't understand, and maybe this is because I didn't have a particularly pleasing childhood. But you don't I, say. I don't understand. Is that obvious? You don't say. I don't understand the compulsion. And look, I'm saying this as a guy with a hundred toys on display behind me. Okay, I understand how that looks. The textuality that is added to something like Marvel Comics in light of being older okay. is world changing in the world of the events, okay. right? Um, I, I never feel the urge to go back and watch episodes of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. Um, I mean, there is always a, we argue of trying to find quality in everything. Uh, this book did open a path for a lot of people. I mean, this turned them into readers. They burned through this and then they wanted to read something else because it was their big first read. So that's a good thing. It did good things. It did. And I can't tell you how many times Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles got me out in the backyard doing flips and cartwheels and thinking I was a superhero. And it, your parkour career has just taken off since then. I'm a star in Russia. You're a star in Russia. Uh, anyway, we're going to so, have no, another... No, hold on. So I never feel the urge to go back to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles television okay. shows, right? Okay. There was another series that was formative in my childhood, and that was the X-Men. Um, the X-Men, at the time, I was, I, I, what was I? I? I must have been six, seven. Okay. I loved it because I was an outcast, right? I Surprised, I didn't have any friends. So seeing those people who were pushed aside simply because they were different made a lot of sense to me. I connected with it. Okay. You go back to it later and you realize that it's a metaphor for racism. You, you notice later than that even that there is a Martin Luther King Jr. and a Malcolm X in the metaphor. You go back to it later and with the understanding that the, okay, so, that, so that's, okay, this is a metaphor for racism, right? Okay. That's a different understanding of the, the X-Men text. It is. Even later, uh, with the understanding that many of the people involved in the early X-Men comic books were Jewish, this becomes deeper because when you look at that first team of X-Men, they're all white. Yeah. But there's something very different about them that society would not accept if they knew. Okay. One of the... They embedded a lot of themselves into the text. Well, well so, so it goes from just being racism to Jewish people can pass 
if they want. That's one of the things. Pass. They can be white if they want. If they, if they look suitable enough in a racist society, they can pass. But there's still something about them that people would hate if they knew. Mutants, if they could suppress their mutation, could pass in society, couldn't they? Okay. Um, so that becomes a very deep metaphor when you look at the original books in that fashion. Right? That's fair. Adds more to the text. It adds more to the... There, there are layers upon layers upon layers in that one text. I don't really see anything here. Like I can, I can sort of see that first layer of, um, well, the second layer, I guess, of going back and realizing this is not about just being different. It's about racism. Okay. There's some of that here, but it's so ham-fisted that you have to believe many of the younger people who are reading this, it's so ham-fisted that it must be alienating to a point to some of the, the young readers. Well, you know, the young boy goes on the quest and learns the skills from, you know, uh, the greats who have come before him, and he has to take up the sword and slay Magic Hitler. How could we go wrong? Uh, you can go wrong by the fact that it's written for children, and it happens over the place of 30,000 pages. That's fair. That's fair. So, we're going to come back next week, because next week we're going to talk a little bit about this memory, The Prince's Tale. Um, and let me tell you, if you think that's J.K.'s last opportunity to be like, you know what, this is a good idea, I'd like to expand upon this, you're wrong. She'll do it again in four chapters. Awesome. Ready for that? No. So we are getting close to the end of this series here, the end of Adrian Reed's Harry Potter, which, I mean, granted, you know, even if it is not your favorite, obviously, I mean, it, it, three years of work, you gotta at least, you know, acknowledge it, you gotta... It's a 31-page chapter. You gotta feel good about something. In the middle of war, we go on a recess for 31 pages. So we'll be back next week with two more chapters of Adrian Reed's Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, chapters 33 and 34. If you would like to join us as we wrap up this journey with Harry Potter, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below and give this video a like as well. And if you'd like to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there's a link as always to our Patreon to be found in the description below.